My name is Sam Vakning, and I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. The Black Death, a pandemic of bubonic plague in the 14th century, decimated between one-third and one-half of Europe's population. Yet it was the best thing to have happened to mankind in many centuries. The depleted number of survivors shared in the vast fortunes of the, de of the deceased, laying the foundation for modern entrepreneurial capitalism. The added physical spaces and vacancies made available by the devastation of numerous households spurred urban renewal and magisterial architecture on an unprecedented scale. The crumbling authority of the church and its minions led to reformist religious theories and the emergence of the Renaissance in arts and sciences. Laborers and women saw their standing in society and capital much improved as the scarcity of workforce rendered them much sought after commodities. So is the solution to our global and escalating woes another pandemic, another black death? Is this what we need? The latest census in Ukraine revealed an apocalyptic drop of 10% of its population from 52.5 million two decades ago to a mere 45.7 million last year. Demographers predict a precipitous decline of one-third in Russia's impoverished, inebriated, disillusioned and aging citizenry. Births in many countries in the rich, industrialized West are below the replacement rate. These bastions of conspicuous affluence are shriveling. Scholars and decision-makers, once terrified by the Malthusian dystopia of a population bomb, are more sanguine now. Advances in agricultural technology eradicated hunger, even in teeming places like India and China. And then there is the old idea of progress. Birth rates tend to decline with higher education levels and growing incomes. Family planning has had a res resounding successes in places as diverse as Thailand, China and Western Africa. Some intellectuals even regard the increase in the world's population as a form of quantitative diversification. As technology homogenizes cultures, societies and civilizations everywhere, the risks associated with such a monoculture grow. Homogenous populations are less adaptable and therefore less fit for survival. The only defense lies in the sheer force of numbers. The greater the number of people goes this strain of thinking, the more varied the human species, such variety and variation being the sole guarantors and generators of adaptability, and therefore survival. In the near past, fecundity used to compensate for infant mortality. As the latter declined, so did the former. Children are means of production in many destitute countries, hence the inordinately large families of the past, a form of insurance against the economic outcomes of the inevitable demise of some of one's offspring. Yet despite these trends, the world's populace is augmented by 80 to 100 million people annually. All of them are born to the younger inhabitants of the more penurious corners of the earth. There, there were only one billion people alive in 1804. The number doubled a century later. But our last billion, the sixth, required only 12 fertile years. The entire population of Germany is added every half a decade to both India and China. Clearly, mankind's growth is out of control, as affirmed in the 1994 Cairo International Conference of Population and Development. Dozens of millions of people regularly starve, many of them to death. In only one corner of the earth, southern Africa, food aid is the sole subsistence of entire countries. More than 18 million people in Zambia, Malawi and Angola survived on charitable donations in 1992, for instance. More than 10 million expect the same this year, among them the emaciated denizens of erstwhile food exporter Zimbabwe. According to Médecins Sans Frontières, AIDS kills 3 million people a year, tuberculosis another 2 million, malaria decimates 2 people every minute, 
more than 14 million people fall prey to parasitic and infectious diseases every year, 90% of them in the developing countries. Millions emigrate every year in search of a better life. These massive shifts are facilitated by modern modes of transportation. But despite these tectonic relocations, and despite famine, disease and war, the classic Malthusian regulatory mechanisms, despite all this, the depletion of natural resources from arable land to water is undeniable and gargantuan. Our pressing environmental issues, global warming, water stress, salinization, desertification, deforestation, pollution, loss of biological diversity, and our ominous social ills, crime at the forefront, are traceable to one politically incorrect truth. There are too many of us. We are way too numerous for our own good. The population load is unsustainable. We, the survivors, would be better off if others were to perish. Should population growth continue unabated, we are all doomed. Doomed to what? Numerous Cassandras and countless Jeremiahs have been falsified by history. With proper governance, scientific research, education, affordable medicines, effective family planning and economic growth, this planet can support even 10 to 12 billion people. We are not at risk of physical extension and never have been. What is hazarded is not our life, but our quality of life. As any insurance actuary, actuary will attest, we are governed by statistical data sets. Consider this single fact. About 1% of the population suffer from the perniciously debilitating and all-pervasive mental health disorder, schizophrenia. At the beginning of the 20th century, there were 16.5 million schizophrenics. Nowadays, there are 64 million of them. Their impact on friends, family and colleagues is exponential and incalculable. This is not a merely quantitative link. This is a qualitative phase transition. Or consider this. Large populations lead to the emergence of high-density urban centers. It is inefficient to cultivate ever smaller plots of land, so people aggregate. Surplus manpower moves to centers of industrial production. A second wave of internal migrants caters to the, to the first wave's needs, thus spawning a service sector. Network effects generate excess capital, and a virtuous cycle of investment, employment and consumption ensues. But overcrowding breeds violence, as has been demonstrated in experiments with mice. The sheer numbers involved serve to magnify and amplify social anomies, deviate behavior and anti-social traits. In the city, there are more criminals, more perverts, more victims, more deviants, more immigrants and more racists per square mile than anywhere else. Moreover, only a planned and orderly urbanization is desirable. The blights that pass for cities in most third world countries are the outgrowth of neither premeditation nor method. These megacities are infested with non-disposed of waste and prone to natural catastrophes and epidemics. No one can vouchsafe for a critical mass of humans, a threshold, a threshold beyond which the species will implode or vanish. Luckily, the ebb and flow of human numbers is subject to three regulatory demographic mechanisms, the combined action of which does give us hope. First, there's the Malthusian mechanism, long declared dead, but actually very much alive. Limited resources lead to wars, famine and diseases, and thus to a decrease in human numbers. Mankind has done well to check famine, fend off disease, and staunch war, but to have done so without a commensurate policy of population control was largely irresponsible. Then there is the assimilative me mechanism. Mankind is not divorced from nature. Humanity is destined to be impacted by its choices and by the reverberations of its actions. Damage caused to the environment haunts, in a complex feedback loop, the perpetrators. Examples, immoderate use of anti anti antibiotics, leads to the eruption of drug-resistant strains of pathogens. A myriad types of cancer are caused by human pollution. Man is the victim of its own destructive excesses. And then there's the cognitive mechanism. 
humans intentionally limit the propagation of their race through family planning, abortion and contraceptives. Genetic engineering will likely intermesh with these to produce enhanced or designed progeny to specifications. We must stop procreating or else pray for a reduction in our numbers in whatever way. This could be achieved benignly, for instance, by colonizing space or the ocean depths, both remote and techni technologically unfeasible possibilities at this stage, or not so benignly. The alternative is cataclysmic. Unintended wars, rampant disease and lethal famines will ultimately trim our numbers, no matter how noble our intentions and how diligent our efforts to curb them. And is this a bad thing? Not necessarily. To my mind, even a Malthusian resolution is preferable to the alternative of slow decay, uniform impecuniosity, and perdition in installments, an alternative made inexorable by our collective irresponsibility and recurrent denial.